This is the first ocean deployment of two new high-precision instruments designed to monitor the Earth's signals from the seafloor. This housing contains the tilt meter and nano-bottom pressure recorder and the associated electronics and cabling used for power and communications. The instruments were deployed on the seafloor by a remotely operated vehicle as part of the Mars seafloor. Observatory testbed located at a depth of 3,000 feet in Monterey Bay in this first test deployment in the ocean. It has already detected the ground motion from several large earthquakes, as far from the Mars site as Chile and the Mariana Trench in the future. The instruments will be part of a global network of cabled seafloor observatories. Because of their precision, these two new instruments are already detecting signals, which could never be measured before. This is the first ocean deployment of two new high-precision instruments designed to monitor the Earth's signals from the seafloor. This housing contains the tilt meter and nano-bottom pressure recorder and the associated electronics and cabling used for power and communications. The instruments were deployed on the seafloor by a remotely operated vehicle as part of the Mars seafloor. Observatory testbed located at a depth of 3,000 feet in Monterey Bay in this first test deployment in the ocean. It has already detected the ground motion from several large earthquakes, as far from the Mars site as Chile and the Mariana Trench in the future. The instruments will be part of a global network of cabled seafloor observatories. Because of their precision, these two new instruments are already detecting signals, which could never be measured before. The shuttle was designed to be a space truck, it's a multi-purpose vehicle. We've done a tremendous number of different things with it. It's the most versatile space vehicle that has ever been built. We've used it to launch satellites. We've used it to repair satellites in orbit and put them back into orbit. We've used it to capture satellites and bring them back to Earth for repair. We've outfitted it with the space lab built by our European partners and used it before the era of the space station to do scientific research. We used it as part of our partnership with the Russians, which is still continuing, first as part of the Mir space station, where we actually prolonged the useful life of Mir by several years through logistical supply visits with the shuttle. And now, of course, we're using it to build the new International Space Station, which is a huge international partnership.
The shuttle was designed to be a space truck, it's a multi-purpose vehicle. We've done a tremendous number of different things with it. It's the most versatile space vehicle that has ever been built. We've used it to launch satellites. We've used it to repair satellites in orbit and put them back into orbit. We've used it to capture satellites and bring them back to Earth for repair. We've outfitted it with the space lab built by our European partners and used it before the era of the space station to do scientific research. We used it as part of our partnership with the Russians, which is still continuing, first as part of the Mir space station, where we actually prolonged the useful life of Mir by several years through logistical supply visits with the shuttle. And now, of course, we're using it to build the new International Space Station, which is a huge international partnership. So, continuing our series of lectures on modernism, we now turn to architecture, and, in particular, to the work of Franco Gehry. Now, I'm not going to go into his career in detail, it is enough to say that early on he was, like other modernist architects, tied to the rectangle, the straight line, and so on. Often their buildings would have this basic shape and they would just, earn, add bits of decoration like splashes of colour or pointless balconies. Soon enough, Gary wanted to break away from straight lines and grid-like designs. He wanted the freedom to experiment with other shapes, curves, and unusually angled roofs. What helped him with this was the computer, which allowed him to visualise and experiment with complex shapes and to work on the whole design as one piece, without the added decoration being thrown in as an afterthought. Architecture as art, if you like, or, or sculpture even. He himself said that he had struggled with crossing the line between architecture and sculpture. Now, I want to talk about one building in particular, Bern, the Guggenheim Museum in Bilbao, which I think you'll agree is a masterpiece. So, continuing our series of lectures on modernism, we now turn to architecture, and, in particular, to the work of Franco Gehry. Now, I'm not going to go into his career in detail, it is enough to say that early on he was, like other modernist architects, tied to the rectangle, the straight line, and so on. Often their buildings would have this basic shape and they would just, earn, add bits of decoration like splashes of colour or pointless balconies. Soon enough, Gary wanted to break away from straight lines and grid-like designs. He wanted the freedom to experiment with other shapes, curves, and unusually angled roofs. What helped him with this was the computer, which allowed him to visualise and experiment with complex shapes and to work on the whole design as one piece, without the added decoration being thrown in as an afterthought. Architecture as art, if you like, or, or sculpture even. He himself said that he had struggled with crossing the line between architecture and sculpture. Now, I want to talk about one building in particular, Bern, the Guggenheim Museum in Bilbao, which I think you'll agree is a masterpiece. You can see that the two charts each give quite a different picture of the performance of boys and girls in the two key subjects of maths and English. It shows that in English, Girls consistently outperform boys over a period of six years, achieving scores about 10% above their male peers. There is quite a different picture when we look at the math results with no real difference between genders in the results. What is the explanation for these key differences? To answer this question, researchers look at biological and cognitive factors and a range of social factors. The interaction between these different components in early childhood development are seen as maintained and reinforced in the school context. And this leads to distinct gender patterns of behavior 
and skills with direct consequences for school performance and achievement. The ultimate uses of this evidence are to show that biological factors, such as patterns of cognitive developments, are closely linked to social factor, such as learned gender categories. These cognitive skills are learned both preschool and subsequently at school, supported by the responses of teachers, creating a reinforcement of patterns. You can see that the two charts each give quite a different picture of the performance of boys and girls in the two key subjects of maths and English. It shows that in English, girls consistently outperform boys over a period of six years, achieving scores about 10% above their male peers. There is quite a different picture when we look at the math results with no real difference between genders in the results. What is the explanation for these key differences? To answer this question, researchers look at biological and cognitive factors and a range of social factors. The interaction between these different components in early childhood development are seen as maintained and reinforced in the school context. And this leads to distinct gender patterns of behavior and skills with direct consequences for school performance and achievement. The ultimate uses of this evidence are to show that biological factors, such as patterns of cognitive developments, are closely linked to social factor, such as learned gender categories. These cognitive skills are learned both preschool and subsequently at school, supported by the responses of teachers, creating a reinforcement of patterns. Honeybees do a waggle dance to direct other bees to sources of nectar. But dancing bees like this one can be halted by a head but from another bee. Now researchers have found that this head but is actually a warning signal. A feeding station was set up in the lab to mimic a source of nectar. Then foraging bees were introduced to the dangers at the station such as competition from rival colonies. When foragers returned to the hive, they stopped bees dancing. Scientist thinks the behavior warns dancers of a dangerous source of nectar. Honeybees do a waggle dance to direct other bees to sources of nectar. But dancing bees like this one can be halted by a head but from another bee. Now researchers have found that this head but is actually a warning signal. A feeding station was set up in the lab to mimic a source of nectar. Then foraging bees were introduced to the dangers at the station such as competition from rival colonies. When foragers returned to the hive, they stopped bees dancing. Scientist thinks the behavior warns dancers of a dangerous source of nectar. All my research and that I conducted with my 60 plus graduate students was motivated by their need to learn so that we can teach. 
Of course, in some inventions happened along the way but I've always considered the end result. And I always consider that this invention to be a byproduct, byproducts of the learning process. The end product for me was always better understanding or when one really succeeded in unifying theory that can help us in teaching the subject. I've also looked at teaching as a vehicle to try new ideas or new ways of doing things on an intelligent group of learners. That is as the vehicle for the teaching research results. And in my experience, this kind of teaching is the most stimulated and motivating to students. I am also uncovered many interesting research problems is the course of teaching the subject. It is this unity of research and teaching their close connection and the benefits gathered by exercising and the interplay that to be recognized as the successful professor. All my research and that I conducted was my 60 plus graduate students was motivated by their need to learn so that we can teach. Of course, in some inventions happened along the way but I've always considered the end result. And I always consider that this invention to be a byproduct, byproducts of the learning process. The end product for me was always better understanding or when one really succeeded in unifying theory that can help us in teaching the subject. I've also looked at teaching as a vehicle to try new ideas or new ways of doing things on an intelligent group of learners. That is as the vehicle for the teaching research results. And in my experience, this kind of teaching is the most stimulated and motivating to students. I am also uncovered many interesting research problems is the course of teaching the subject. It is this unity of research and teaching their close connection and the benefits gathered by exercising and the interplay that to be recognized as the successful professor. In our survey, over 100 CEOs who had recently been through an acquisition or merger were asked which areas of their activities needed the most effort. As you can see, the most frequent response to this question was that information technology requires the most effort. According to 58% of those we surveyed, IT was the most time-consuming and needed the most work. But this is understandable, as many of the IT issues are extremely complex and the consequences of any change in IT can have a significant impact. The key is how quickly and effectively IT integration can be achieved. And there has to be a clear understanding of the consequences there may be of not getting it right. The two other areas requiring significant attention, sales, marketing, and business development on the one hand, and financial management on the other both were selected by 49% of the respondents.
In our survey, over 100 CEOs who had recently been through an acquisition or merger were asked which areas of their activities needed the most effort. As you can see, the most frequent response to this question was that information technology requires the most effort. According to 58% of those we surveyed, IT was the most time-consuming and needed the most work. This is understandable, as many of the IT issues are extremely complex and the consequences of any change in IT can have a significant impact. The key is how quickly and effectively IT integration can be achieved. And there has to be a clear understanding of the consequences there may be of not getting it right. The two other areas requiring significant attention, sales, marketing, and business development on the one hand, and financial management on the other both were selected by 49% of the respondents. But we can really thank the great exhibition of 1851 for giving us the world's premier taxi service, for it was going to this exhibition and this fabulous exhibition invention from all around the four corners of the empire that the visitors were appalled, dismayed and vexed by their journeys to this exhibition because the cabbies of the day and their horse-drawn carts were absolutely terrible, could not find their way to this exhibition. And, so, a great public outcry, the London Authority sets up Public Carriage Office, which is an organisation that still exists and you can take a short walk to Penton Street up the road. And this public carriage office took on the responsibility of licensing all major taxi drivers in London. All taxi drivers from 1851 onwards had to pass what is now known as the London Knowledge, was phenomenal knowledge of London. What is the London Knowledge? It's the ability to remember the 25,000 streets, have it all interconnected and all the main arterial roads in and out of London. Cabbies need to know all this plus a thousand points of specific interest, cafes, bars, public offices. They need to know them all as part of their training. But we can really thank the great exhibition of 1851 for giving us the world's premier taxi service, for it was going to this exhibition and this fabulous exhibition invention from all around the four corners of the empire that the visitors were appalled, dismayed and vexed by their journeys to this exhibition because the cabbies of the day and their horse-drawn carts were absolutely terrible, could not find their way to this exhibition. And, so, a great public outcry, the London Authority sets up Public Carriage Office, which is an organisation that still exists. And you can take a short walk to Penton Street up the road. And this public carriage office took on the responsibility of licensing all major taxi drivers in London. All taxi drivers from 1851 onwards had to pass what is now known as the London Knowledge, was phenomenal knowledge of London. What is the London Knowledge? It's the ability to remember the 25,000 streets, have it all interconnected and all the main arterial roads in and out of London. Cabbies need to know all this plus a thousand points of specific interest, cafes, bars, public offices. They need to know them all as part of their training. 